Hey guys, this is Elise. Welcome back to this project, Catholic and Christian Friends for Intersectional Racial Healing. I am with my best friend, Adora, this morning. And Hello. <laughs> and we're so excited to spend time with each other, but also to share with you a conversation about our racial experiences and to show that it doesn't have to be intimidating. It doesn't have to be threatening and um, can really even help build a friendship and um, learn more about each other. And at the same time, we want to give a little disclaimer that we're not trying to solve all of the world's problems related to race in one little video. This is just to show that conversations can happen. And, um, you know, just one conversation at a time. So with that, we'll get started. Um, and I guess, you know, just to open up, Adora, I really appreciated that you were willing to share about something so personal, so deeply personal to like your development to your growth, like from when you were a kid on your intro video. And um, I'm curious about just like the process of like, of like meaning making and like how you like navigated that either with people or on your own um, up to this point. And it's, I, it's real, it's real, it's a broad question on purpose. Like I don't want to force whatever, like I'm not looking for particular something. So just whatever, as much or as little as you're comfortable sharing on screen, would love to hear. Yeah, so I think process wise, um, so one of the main things I shared in my intro video was that um, I, like people who looks like me were not represented in terms of people who were considered beautiful. And so I realized this kind of subconsciously, but then like made a deliberate decision to enter into my beauty and discover what beauty would look like for me. Um, so then process wise, I think I came to that decision in like early college or in high school. And I think several things contributed to that. So number one, um, my mom went natural. So that's a term black people use to say, stopped like chemically processing her hair and started just wearing her hair in styles that complemented the, nat the natural texture of her hair. So when she did that, right now that's kind of a movement, uh, but she kind of did it before it was a movement, before it was cool. She's the original hipster, right? So um, she just came home one day and she had a short afro and we were all like, what? And she was very unapologetic about it. She was like, this is my hair, the end. So she started wearing these different styles and as I saw her wearing these styles, looking confident, looking attractive, looking unique, and looking natural, I wanted to emulate her. And yeah. so I would ask her, hey, mom, like, can you do that style on me? Maybe she was wearing finger coils. Maybe she was wearing two-strand twists. Maybe she was wearing a braid out. All these different styles. Um, and she was like, I can't, I can't, I can't, because your hair is relaxed. Your hair is relaxed. So then one day, she just cut off my hair. So that was kind of a pivotal moment, because she didn't quite tell me she was cutting my hair. She just kind of did it when she was selling it one day and I was like horrified, yeah. but I ended up growing into it. Okay, so that was one um, moment of processing. And then another was just deciding, okay, since I know I'm not represented image-wise, I need to work extra hard to find images of myself um, that are beautiful. So, so I would look up like dark skin models, like Alec Weck is a big example. She was like one of the biggest dark skin models at the time I was on the search. There were a couple YouTubers who I thought were really attractive. I'm like, hey, let me watch their stuff. Let me just surround myself with images of dark skin women who are attractive, who are beautiful. Um, so I can just see that there are people like me who are beautiful. So that was really helpful. Um, when Lupita Nyong'o came on the scene, that was huge for me because she was like globally recognized as an attractive person, which honestly shocked me. Cause like I knew she was attractive when I saw her in 12 years a slave. And I was like, I'm going to Google her. She's stunning. Um, and then I saw that other people thought she was attractive. And I was like, wow, I, I was, I was floored. I was very happy, but I was floored. I'd never seen a dark skinned woman get that kind of like recognition from um, across races that yeah. she yeah. was attractive and like just attractive and beautiful and feminine, not like, cool, unique, or edgy, because that's usually how our beauty is perceived, I think. But she was just considered feminine and beautiful. And that was huge. So yeah, all those things contributed to my processing, choosing to surround myself with images of dark skinned women, mm -hmm. Lupita Nyong'o, and my mom going natural. 
and then natural hair becoming a thing in society too. Um, there's still some discrimination in there that I won't get into, but it's a start. You know what I mean? You don't have to like chemically process your hair to be considered professional. That's huge. That's a change that happened in my lifetime. Um, and so it's cool to see someone like my little sister. She never really had to go through that because by the time she was coming of age, natural hair was more acceptable. So I'm, I'm happy to see that kind of progress in society. Yeah. Yeah. I think I'm hearing like a combination of things. Like there was like the internal drive where you were like, I'm going to find this or create it or whatever it takes. It's going to like, you started here and at about the same time, it sounds like your mom had her own process where she then modeled for you. And you were like, well, I know my mom. I love my mom. And like you had a strong family member in your life who was like, I'm going to do self-love and this is what it is. And like gave no like apologetics for it. Like you were just like, oh, this is happening. And like, as a kid, it's like, well, mom's always right. You know? So then it's like, yes. Like if mom's saying this is cool, then like it like automatically, like it does something on the inside. Right. Yeah. Exactly. And then you saw like outside there's global acclaim for an individual who you identify with and you're like, whoa, this is, it doesn't just have to be in the four walls of our home. It's like, it can safely be also elsewhere. And that was huge, 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 huge. huge. Yeah. Which is so cool. Cause like, you know, our hair is our first garment. Um, Ooh, I like that. I like that. Like, mm. obviously we have skin, but like on top of our skin, our hair is our first protective layer for every human. And for you to like reclaim your hair, for your mom to reclaim her hair, to like for her to help you reclaim your hair is a beautiful thing. Um, so those are like my first like emotions with what you're saying. And I just, I'm like so happy for you. I feel like I'm going to cry. Like it's just, yeah, it makes me so happy that like your first garment is reclaimed for you. Your first girl, thank you. Clothing from God, you know. I will say the good thing about going through that process is like no one can take beauty away from me now, you know. Um, if I wasn't externally validated to begin with and I had to like find that on my own, yeah. Then mm -hmm. if the culture tries to take it from me, I'm sorry, I did too much work <laughs> to get here. So it's not happening, you know? Right, right. Yeah. You know, it's really interesting when I look at like dynamic of, of taking, um, and actually, I don't know where I want to go with this. There's like so many ways to go with this. I, <laughs> um, and it, it does feel different talking on camera than it does just us. So. <laughs> right. No pressure. <laughs> um, I also have a question for you on here yeah. though. Yeah, go ahead. You'd be willing to share. I'm just wondering what your experience is with hair because I know that um, beauty standards in this country do tend to be Eurocentric in general. So I wonder if you have any experiences with your hair or, you know, how you feel about your hair, what your perception of your hair is. Has that changed over time? Because um, yeah. two things with that, right? So you're Asian. So, um, your hair is coarser, but straight in yeah, general, yeah. right? And then secondly, a lot of people use Asian hair for weaves. Um, so, or at least like used to before natural hair became a thing. So yeah. I'm just, I'm curious about your perception of hair too. Yeah, yeah. It's so cool that we're talking about this. Like, honestly, I wasn't planning to look like this for the video, but then I was like, wait. How appropriate though. How appropriate. Yeah. So I just kept it like this. Yeah. I feel like there's a lot of narratives around and, and personal experiences around hair too that I connect with. Like when you're talking about your mom chopping your hair off, I was like remembering this visceral memory I have when I was eight years old and my, um, oh no, sorry, 11 years old. And my mom was like, this is the trendy thing. This is so cool. And then she chopped my hair up to here above my ears. And like a bowl cut? mortified oh my gosh <laughs> not quite a bowl cut but it was bad I was like I don't care how fashionable this is according to right. Dee or Chanel do not care 
you're I out. Like a boy. <laughs> and she was like, it's so cute. And I, I'm, I'm actually in retrospect, really thankful for that experience because my mom went through breast cancer twice and she like her hair has not been the same since then. And there are things that she has lost that she feels that she has lost with her femininity, with her identity, with like things that were reliable because it was her body itself and no longer is like predictable or reliable or, you know, constant. Mm -hmm. um, Cause we are, we always have a relationship with ourselves from birth to death. And that's the longest relationship other than God who created us. And, and then, and then us like, so he knew us from eternity. We know ourselves from birth to death and that's the longest human relationship we have. Right. So, um, watching my mom go through all that and, and being there with her and like helping her just get up in bed and take a bath and different things. It deeply impacted me. So right now my hair is super long, partially because of quarantine, but also partially because I'm growing it out and I want to like make a wig for her with my own hair. Oh, that's beautiful. That's really beautiful. Yeah. You, Cause you, she gave you your hair too. Exactly. Right. Mm -hmm. Like this is whatever I got is hers. And the other day we we're sitting together and I was like, I never liked my feet, but actually they look just like yours and you have cute feet. Like now I love my feet because they look like yours. <laughs> and she's like, yeah, everything good you have is mine. And I was like, uh, <laughs> Dad didn't give you the good genes. I did. Let's be clear. All right. Love it. <laughs> so, yeah, she can be pretty, like, she can be sharp-witted sometimes. So I was like, yeah, and there's other cute things, too, with Dad. So, um, yeah, I, I, like, I think that's, like, the most personal narrative I have about my hair is, like, that feeling I have of, like, it's not that I'm required to give something to my mom because my culture has filial piety or because of this or that, but, like, just out of this deep love, like, there is a connection on right here, like, my hair, that I can, like, give back to her, and she gave it to me first, you know, and, and just, like, wanting to give whatever I can in that journey of healing and, and growth and moving into the future, and I remember telling her when she was going through all those surgeries, I was like, I think you look beautiful. Like you look the same. Obviously your body's different now, but like, actually to me, you don't look any different. And she like started crying and she was like, I don't know if I can handle this. And like, you're being like so nice to me. And like, the reason I'm sharing this right now is I feel like when our appearance, our, our beauty, our inner beauty, our outer beauty is attacked, or like claimed by someone else or something else, like whether it's a culture or like, a, like this other force of nature, like a disease or whatever, like it really violates our sense of well-being, you know? And so like when you were speaking about, obviously I should, I, I should use I statements, but like it's kind of the pattern I, that I feel I see with like in, in conversations with friends is like, when our hair gets touched without permission, when our hair gets cut the wrong way without permission, when, you know, all these things happen with our hair, with our body, it's like, even though this doesn't have nerve endings to it, the hair, like, it does something. It feels like a violation unless we choose it for ourselves. And like, that's just like, with like the friends that I've talked with and I don't know all six billion people on the planet, but like, that's something I've noticed. And, um, and I think that's like, I don't even know if I'm really answering your question anymore, but like, I, I like really connect with like your, your hair story and, um, even just like your mom's story, like you and your mom. Um, yeah, I don't know. Is this, is this okay of an answer? I don't know if I, I feel it like, is. Kinda, like it is. it's relational. <laughs> which is cute. I love it. Thanks. Yeah. Um, yeah. What do you think? What do you think with like, do you feel like this is a, cause I, I, I'm not sure that I think it's a, 
a female thing. Like I almost feel like it's a male thing too about like the, the judgment or the um, like allocation of what certain appearances are. Mm -hmm. and so like, I guess connecting back to your more societal question about using Asian hair for weaves. It's so curious to me because I'm like a part of me is like, I understand the dialogue about cultural appropriation, you know, like I get it that there's like things that kind of feel like it should just stay for that group or that person or whatever. And it's about like not wanting to be violated. Right. But then there's this other part of me that's like, because I also like want to like, you know, like I shared about my mom about wanting to help. If something I have can help someone else, I want to help them. And like knowing how hard it is for the times when people had to wear weaves just to function with a job in society, I'm happy to help. You know, like I'm happy that that Asian hair was used to help to function, to not like be blocked from entry into a job. And I know there's other complicated variables that are attached to that of like, well, what should help look like? Should it, char should it be charged for anything? Or should it be free? Should it be donated? All like there's a lot of like pieces that follow that. But I guess like personally where I come from is like, yeah, I guess there could be pieces of appropriation, but I feel like there's such a distinction between like pure mockery uh, with a, with appropriation and like creating it into a farce or a joke or like this meaningless thing. And then, and then there's like a difference when it's like adopted to help grow ourselves, to like help us survive or get to where we need to be in some way. I think there's like something different there, you know, like Asians and, and, and people of color, of, of any color and biracial identities are minorities in the United States right now, but you take a white person and bring them and drop them off in Asia, they're a minority there. And you take a, a black person and drop them off in Africa and they're a minority there too, because an American black person is different than a, an African American of a particular country, like a Kenyan or a um, Egyptian or a, like, et cetera, a, you know, like a Libyan or um, I mean, now I'm going to the Middle East, but like, or towards the Middle East, but like, there's just North a, Africa. Yeah. And, and so I just feel like, I feel like some of those nuances get lost in the conversation sometimes, but as a friend, I can like, kind of like ramble and like, you know, I have this liberty to like speak a little bit more. Like find your way. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So I feel like, yeah, I'm kind of all over the place, but like, what do you think? No, that makes sense to me. Um, it's interesting because I think like which group is using what item and for what like all changes those dynamics, right? Um, like I think um, since Black people are kind of like at the bottom in <laughs> most cultures, like it's us using something um, yeah, like, I see what you're saying. Like, I wouldn't qualify it as, like, inappropriate appropriation. Um, but I don't know either if, like, like, should I consider it a help that we had access to that weave? You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, to, like, kind of band-aid over the deeper issue of right. we are being discriminated against right. because of something that naturally occurs out of our heads. Right. Or should I be, um, I don't know, it's hard because it's a band-aid, it's a band-aid to a deeper issue. So I'm like, so then is it actual help? Right, right. Yeah, yeah. And that brings up a lot of different things too. Like, there are people in South Korea, like there's such a westernization. It's like, like some people say like it's the perfect and only good example of democracy that was transplanted outside of the United States in the world. Some people say this. Um, and then there's like the darker side to that, the underbelly. And there are people who, uh, 
prostitute themselves to pay for cosmetic procedures to look white. Parents, a great majority, will pay for, or if they can't afford it, the, the child will find a way to pay for plastic surgery to look more Western. Um, and they literally cannot find a job. So they're in their own country, discriminated for looking ethnic, for looking mm -hmm. Korean, in a Korean dominant society in that right. country. Like they have to look more white to have access to a job, mm -hmm. to pay their bills. They have to like take on massive debt to like pay for surgery. To that reminds me of parts of Brazil. Yeah, yeah, it's wild. And mm -hmm. like it certainly like, and so on, you know, there's like the two sides of it, right? It's like the surgeons are like, oh, I'm doing a favor because you're like, but then, right, because without me, you couldn't get a job. Right, right. And then Why the, can't I get a job in my own country looking like I'm from here? Right. right, right, right. And then there's like, well, then why are you charging for it? Right, so there's that economic piece. And then it's like, what you're saying, is it actually help? But like on the level of like, can you even get your Maslow's hierarchy of needs met to eat food? Maybe it, like on that level, it's help. So it's like this. No, that's a good point. Because also too, I think sometimes like, um, like when I was pursuing commercial television, um, hair was an issue and hair was part of the reason that I left that field. I didn't feel like changing my hair just to be on TV basically, right. but you know, I could have taken the route of, okay, you know, I'm going to put up with this beauty standard and I'm going to wear this weave. And then like, once I reach a certain level of success, I can use that success as a power to then say, okay, now I don't have to wear my hair like this because at my XYZ level, you know? Right. And like, I can respect someone doing that. I can respect someone saying, okay, I don't agree with this standard, but like, I'm going to play the game, so to speak, so that I can use my influence later on to change the game. Yeah, I feel like that's kind of where like, you know how there's like poems and there's like writings about how our grandmothers prayed for this or they sacrificed for this, mm -hmm. like those. Yeah um sayings I feel like that is so true for like families and cultures that have been struggling and struggling and um and that we kind of we continue to pay it forward and I I don't mean that I don't think that means that like nothing should change but like given the reality of certain circumstances right. I don't actually know I I don't know so like um I mean, that makes sense. Yeah, there is some sense of we pave the way for tomorrow. Even like, yes, things should change today, but they don't. Okay, so we pave the way for tomorrow. We pave the way for our children, for their children, et cetera. Because um, even like I said with my sister earlier, that she grew up in a different world than me in terms of her hair um, automatically being professional or unprofessional. Right. And that that's good for me to see that kind of change already, you know? Yeah, yeah. And it's really curious because like language also plays such a huge role into that, right? Like what is um so like from English, from like the golden standard of like whiteness would be England, you know, the UK. Um in their in that language, our hair, like you said, is described as coarse, various levels of coarse. Right. Then in the actual like languages of like where people of color are from, like for so like poetry that describes a beautiful woman in East Asia is like mm -hmm. her face is round like a round and pale like a moon and yeah. her hair is like black and like flowing and like mm. actually it's kind of the shape of what I have right now. But in right. Her, and it's You're like a classic painting. <laughs> well, I'm kind of dark for it, but like <laughs> it's just like she's you know this look yeah and, very pale mm -hmm. yeah and like looks like um she can stay indoors and da 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 and um and her hair is braided and it's like around the head and um at least in Korea and um and so that, that like it's described in a silky way not coarse right in that language and then like when we look at Song of Solomon's which um Song of Songs, which is written by a Jewish man, you know, speaking about his beloved. Now, people interpret that differently theologically, but like, they're people of color 
from the yep. Middle East, you know, and like he describes her hair like I, I forget exactly. It might be goats or sheep. I was gonna say goats running down a mountain or something. <laughs> Forgive me, biblical scholars. Yes. <laughs> right. Like that language is to describe something beautiful, you know, and her neck is like a tower, like a citadel, like a super long and whatever. Like the the language of it in the original translation is a certain way that describes beauty as the standard for their people, for our people, you know? And then outside, outsiders describe it in their own way that's like, well, it doesn't match our central standard. And given how much like English as a language has proliferated as the standard language of business globally, um, or telecommunications is and like the internet is basically English, you know? Oh yeah. Um, dominant. Like that conveys so much things about value inherent in the language itself. Um, no, that's true. And even with that internet thing, um, there was a time I really wanted to live in Uganda. And so I was just trying to look up people's perspectives on living there. And like the only things I can find about living in UG are by white people who are not from UG who moved there, you know, which is a valuable perspective, but it's just like interesting that those are the, <laughs> those are the top perspectives that I can find, not perspectives from my own people who live there, you know? Um, so yeah, it was, it was really hard to try to learn about what would a black American experience to be like over there, especially because I'm kind of Ugandan, but I'm not, you know what I mean? Because I'm a descendant. Um, yeah, so I, I, that's when I noticed that about the internet. Like who writes the internet? Right. Yeah, yeah. That brings, yeah, that's a lot of curious pieces about how language plays such a subconscious role in our self-understanding and the rewriting of narratives that we have to do. For self-love kind of like circling back to what you were saying at the beginning of today's conversation and what you said too um with language so i remember when i was younger the like black hair care section at the drugstore was like coarse dry nappy um brittle broken hair like that's literally how they would describe it broken oh my gosh okay so a lot of negative adjectives right Mm -hmm. Um, now people have moved more to terms like kinky, coily, textured, okay, a little more palatable. Um, but yeah, it's like, no wonder you grow up hating yourself. My goodness, broken, brittle, dry, you know, and then people are like, why didn't you feel beautiful? I'm like, that's what? <laughs> right, right. Like, those are like words that you use to describe a dead plant, like not, right. mm-mm. Or like fabrics that don't really work for people, but for animals, like, no, or even machinery, you know, like, actually, I don't think I could even say that for machinery. Usually like machinery gets like the soft fabrics to like shine it, not coarse things. Um, yeah, that's wild. It's actually wild language to, di to make a denota uh, denotating wildness. Um, exactly. And then that's the norm. You right. Know? Then that's the vocabulary you are used to. It's like, okay, dry, broken section. Okay, that's me, you know? And then mm -hmm. just subconsciously making that connection all the time. Mm -hmm. Oh boy. Yeah. And then like the exotic, the weird, the smelly things, Asian. Right. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's all over there. Mm -hmm. and, like, and it's got its own store too. Like, we might not have whites only supermarkets, but essentially we kind of do. Right? No, you're right. Because like, I grew up going to the Asian supermarket because there are certain fish that we like to eat growing yeah. up that was over there. So that's where we went. Yeah. And I loved all the candy and little pocky sticks and stuff too. <laughs> Green tea gum. I was, was shocked fun. to learn that Michael knew what pocky is. Okay, Michael is a real one. Come on. Like, of course he knows what it is. Michael. <laughs> pocky is so good. It is. And I was like, I always thought it was a Korean thing. And then I found out like, I don't know, a week ago from him that it was like a Japanese thing. And he was like, you think all the good things are Korean. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, look, I'm not biased, but you know, <laughs> that's funny. Oh, that's funny. <laughs> yeah, we have silly conversations too. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. Um, wow. This was a pretty deep conversation already. Um, you know, so like 
I hate to be the bad cop, but since I am the timekeeper in these project video, in this project videos, um, before we close, I'm curious if, if you have like any other thoughts, like, or questions or like talking points that you want to explore a bit more? No, I just appreciate the project as a whole. It's been cool to see it unfold and watch different people's videos and just learn about different people's experiences. So hats off to you, my friend. Oh, thanks. Well, I've had a lot of fun with you and with other friends, and I'm glad that it's been a pretty positive experience for everyone. Um, yeah, so this has been really fun. So for those who are watching, we just want to encourage you. Um, build in community, build in friendship, and- Phone a friend. Yes, check in on someone, ask some curious questions, share about yourself and um, be willing to grow together. It's gonna be okay. This doesn't have to be a threatening talking point. It's just another talking point and it may take a bit more care, but it's just another talking point. And uh, with that, we wish you all God bless. Bye. <laughs>